Hello and welcome back. This is our 1-2 lecture. So closing out the first week of uh, material that we've got here, the slides. Uh, let's jump right on into it. So last time as we were considering things, some of the units that I wanted to bring up is that typically when we're talking about like a global energy usage, we typically use a unit called a quad just technically short for a quadrillion British thermal units, and that's why we don't say that every single time, and we just say quad. Um, but it's a pretty significant amount of energy, right? And the reason that we do this is because, largely speaking, it's difficult to conceptualize such large numbers. If you're trying to imagine what 10 to the 15th looks like, there's really not a good way, right? Even to the point of getting to a thousand of something is very hard for our brain to really process. So 1,000 versus 2,000, if you look at like grains of rice, it's very hard to distinguish an exact number at that point. And by the time you're getting to magnitudes like 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th, that's simply too large for us to really think about. So instead, bringing it down to a simple unit like a quad makes it a little bit easier for us to talk about to kind of compare some of these numbers. And we also saw, saw last time uh, about where those numbers are at. Global energy usage and specific to the USA energy usage. Uh, and the year we picked is 2019 because that was the last, call it normal year, right? Uh, not that everything completely stopped, but uh, when you're talking about a lot of different industry and commercial settings closing down, at least temporarily, that's gonna see a major hit to the total energy usage. So 2019 is a pretty good metric of where we were most recently at. Uh, I imagine in a year or two around where we'll be back from or, you know, kind of growth in relation to. So <clears throat> what I want to focus on here today, not rehashing the previous stuff from before, is how do some of these other countries compare? Right, let's talk about some of these other details about what we're seeing here, at least in total energy usage and specifically here, electricity usage. And I bring this up as this is electricity usage per country, uh, which is not exactly the same as energy, right? There is a significant portion of our energy that is going into electricity or is uh, really electricity is kind of like a secondary source. But at the end of the day, there's not just electricity that is contributing to our energy, not even in a household sense. Right? Many people have water heaters or furnaces that run on something like natural gas. That never has electricity, uh, I mean, besides some of the uh, meters and pumps. But for the most part, the large 99% majority of that energy is just from burning the natural gas. But it is something of interest when you start to look at electricity is a pretty big factor when you're looking at things like hospitals, medicine, food, uh, household expenditures. Uh, and this gives a little bit of a sense of, you know, between China and the U.S., we've got a pretty large majority of all the electricity being used in the world. You can see how that drops off pretty rapidly. And there's a couple different reasons for that. We'll dive into some of these in a little bit here. But uh, really what we're seeing here is just the energy in total. And I want you to keep that in mind. We'll come back to that point. If we're looking at something like petroleum consumption instead of electricity, I think this is a little bit more telling for why America ends up using a lot of its energy. Largely speaking, USA is pretty big. It's really big, in fact. Uh, when you're comparing the size of the USA or its individual states, you're going to see that a lot of the individual states are about the same size as many other European countries. And I point out the European countries because you know, pretty frequently they are uh, in a same kind of tier of development. So what we're seeing here is a lot of the energy that the USA requires is for transportation, simply because there's more distance between everything. Uh, so when you're comparing some of these numbers, it makes a little bit more sense why would would be seen some of these numbers like this, why petroleum is so important, but petroleum is not exclusively used for just for transportation. There are other things that go into this. Uh, China and India both using a pretty significant amount of petroleum as well. Uh, again, in large part because of consumption for transportation. But you've got other things, like when you're talking about refining different materials or industry for creating plastics, there's going to be a lot of oil used in processes like that as well. So this is not even necessarily just talking about energy usage, although it kind of seems that way. 
Uh, this could also be involved with some other of those things that require gasoline, not gasoline, uh, crude oil as a first step uh, in a lot of plastics and a couple different medicinal uses. Um, but I would say still the large part of that is probably transportation. <clears throat> so comparing this a little bit more fair with everyone. Uh, and I say this is a little bit more fair because what we're looking at here is energy usage per person, or the fancy way to say that is per capita. So looking at it like this, I think this gives a little bit of a better sense of what's actually going on with our energy consumption, right? You might argue that the USA, you know, however much energy we use, well, it might be larger simply because we've got a lot of people here. Right? When you compare to some of these other smaller countries, then they're not going to be using as much simply because they don't have as many people. But there is still a little bit of both going on here. Right, Of course, there is more people, so there is more energy consumption. But at the same time, the USA also has this trend of consuming a lot more energy per person and having more people. That's what puts us pretty high on those leaderboards of energy consumption. Uh, and you can see this as this number has grown quite a bit over the years compared to a regular worldwide average. Uh, and now a worldwide average is not necessarily a fair comparison, of course, because again, there are multiple countries in different stages of development, uh, and those less developed countries don't use nearly the same amount of energy, right? Although they are uh, slowly starting to increase there. You can see that dip, especially in the uh, last century or so. Um, but there's been a, a very large increase in the USA, and I think you can see that a lot of this is actually trending along the lines of when automobiles started becoming a big feature. Uh, so automobiles and electricity for the use of things like lights and refrigeration, those started right around the turn of the 1900s. Uh, so we're starting to see that very rapid increase. Uh, and you can compare this to some of the other countries. Right, I think this is quite an interesting one because if you want to compare this to something like the United Kingdom or Japan, you know, similarly developed countries, you see that they're peaking out around four kilowatts per person, whereas modern day US is at 10 kilowatts per person. Uh, so still a pretty significant increase. And a lot of that is from transportation, but not all of it. So. All of these things that I've been talking about, not all of them, but most of them that I've been talking about have been energy sources that we call primary sources, right? The first place that the energy comes from. So when you wanna talk about something like crude oil or coal or solar or nuclear, those are all primary sources. Generally speaking, when those things are extracted with the exception of solars in a little bit of a weird spot, but all these other ones, uh, it's released as heat first. Right? We take that energy, whatever we do to try to consume that fuel source, we are extracting heat from that fuel source. It's the first step, no refinement. So gasoline would not be considered a primary source. Uh, no refinement whatsoever, exactly as we extract that uh, you know, fuel source in the first place, that's what we call our primary source. And we can break this down to uh, what we see between different primary sources. So this graph is uh, pretty interesting, I think, because we can start to see some of the trends, uh, especially the comparative sizes of a lot of these, right? Notice that right around the nuclear age starts, we start, started to see a, a pretty ready increase for a while, but uh, after some of the events, uh, like Three Mile Island, there was a little bit more fear in the popular mind about what nuclear was doing. So the amount of energy that we have from nuclear has kind of scaled back. It's maintained where it's at, but it hasn't seen the same sort of growth that it was before. Renewables, on the other hand, uh, have been quite plentiful for some amount of time. And actually, it's not shown on this graph, but if you scale this back even further, right down to like the 1890s, for example, what we actually would have found is that renewable energy was one of the primary sources, like talking in a matter of size here. Most of our energy was coming from renewables at that time because we were starting to see the advent of electricity, but the first electricity plants were hydroelectric dams. So of course there were still other things, oil being used for a couple different reasons, but uh, if you're talking about energy and a lot of that consumption as we started to see the rapid development of the industrial age, a lot of that was actually coming from hydroelectric dams. 
It wasn't until we started to get a little bit more clever with creating fossil fuel power plants that the fossil fuels really did start to see that same sort of growth. But just comparing the last 60, 70 years here, this is kind of about what we're expecting to see. You see, it's a little bit hard to see on this graph, but if we jump to the next one, uh, it's a little bit more clear to see that natural gas has seen uh, a steady increase in the recent decade. Uh, it's just a, a really, you know, comparatively speaking, to, compared to something like coal, uh, it, it burns very clean. It is very easy to extract. It is naturally extracted alongside petroleum. So uh, natural gas has started to see more and more use. Coal has been dropping off simply because it's just not as good of a fuel source. We'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about the fossil fuels specifically, but uh, coal is one of those things that, simply put, really doesn't have too much of a good future. Uh, there's not a, a reason to use it. Uh, modern day is a little bit more difficult to transport because it's solid, so you can't really pack it as well as something like a fluid. Uh, it doesn't burn very clean, so you've got a lot more filtration steps to actually make sure that the exhaust from your power plants is clean. Um, coal consumption nowadays is starting to look for more use in things like steel production. Right, using it in some of these locations where we need specifically that solid material or that we can refine it into something that's a little bit more useful. But when you're thinking about something like regular power plants based on coal, the USA is really not going to be seeing a growth in that anytime soon. Right, not unless something were to happen where we suddenly run out of all of the oil and we need to pick coal back up. But I'm pretty doubtful that that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, but I like this one a little bit. It doesn't show what's going on with the total energy in the same way that this graph does, but it does give us a good sense of the source-by-source -source comparisons. So speaking of energy density, let me actually give that a good definition here, right? So the idea of energy density, if you've heard of saying things like mass density or just what we usually call density, what that normally means is how much matter is packed into a space. So when we transform that into energy density, we're not thinking about the matter as much as we're thinking about, okay, within this tiny space, how much energy do I have? Generally speaking, higher energy density is usually better for a couple different reasons, right? For one, because when we're actually talking about burning something, that is typically a more refined fuel. You're able to extract more energy out of that. It burns hotter, a lot of factors like that. But also when you're thinking about transporting it, that's another really key factor here, right? If we're trying to compare something like regular old timber, right, recently cut down trees versus something like refined gasoline, one of those things burns much more rapidly. One of those has a much higher energy density, right, the oil. So when you're talking about the transportation, if you needed to get three gigajoules, so three times 10 to the ninth joules, a pretty significant amount of energy, but not anything super crazy, uh, if you needed to transport that much energy, you have to think about how many trucks would you need, right? If you're comparing this variety of trucks, the higher energy density simply requires fewer trucks or fewer round trips of those trucks. So we like that higher energy density. The one drawback of that is something that is very high energy density can also have a little bit more danger associated with it. But if we're careful, we take the proper precautions. Uh, usually that's not a factor that we need to worry too much about. But uh, comparing a lot of these things, right, most of the time we're looking towards this energy density, uh, but part of this also depends on how we end up using it. So if you want to compare something like hydrogen gas, technically speaking, there is a little bit of trace hydrogen in the atmosphere, and it's not useful, right? Really not useful, because for the most part, it's going to be interacting with other things, the energy density of that hydrogen gas. Even though hydrogen gas, if we could, you know, refine it, have a tank of hydrogen gas, very high energy density. Comparing it to atmosphere, though, it's just not practical. Likewise for oxygen, right? There could be a lot of potential energy uh, if you've got a tank of oxygen, but the regular oxygen in atmosphere, not super useful. So comparing these things, right, we also do need to consider how we can actually utilize that energy source. Nuclear fuel rods might be a fantastic place to consider this as well, right? Because really there's a very high energy density to uranium fuel rods, but how much energy we can actually extract very much depends on the reactor. So there are these factors that we have to consider when we're talking about a lot of these details, how we're actually extracting that energy, how useful that is. Uh, if you want to even compare something like 
Let's imagine a generator based on natural gas versus the furnace in your house. The furnace in your house, when that burns the natural gas, right, it burns the energy turns into heat from chemical energy into heat. Furnaces are generally supposed to be heating a home. So I would say that is like a 99% energy efficiency transfer of whatever energy the natural gas had before to whatever heat is in the house now. All of that was converted or just about a little bit lost, but not very much. Most of that energy converted to heat the ideal end source of that energy compared to a generator. Generator, similarly, has to burn that natural gas to work. But now we're in heat, we're not at our final step yet. We still have to go through the generator, actually spin whatever turbines we're talking about here, and that is at most a 70% efficiency. But I'm gonna say if you're talking about a, you know, a smaller generator based on natural gas, we're probably not getting anywhere near that either. So the energy density there begins to depend on how we're actually using it. In a house, very high efficiency. So most of that actual energy density that's in there, we can utilize. The effective energy density is much higher. Compared to a generator use, really not the same effective energy density, even if it's the exact same material. So <clears throat> some of these primary sources, right? I'm sure you've heard of this before. We can break them down into the renewable category and the non-renewable category. Uh, and renewable just generally means we can resupply it within a lifetime, maybe-ish. Uh, and I, I'm a little bit hazy on this one just because if you're looking at something like forest wood, there's a little bit of an argument here that it's a renewable resource, not a non-renewable resource, right? Because trees grow. Uh, if you plant a tree right now, if you come back in 20 years, you'll see that tree is much larger. There is some more wood there. What really puts it into the non-renewable category is this idea that we are using this wood at a faster rate than it's growing back. That's why it's not necessarily a renewable resource like wind or solar or uh, hydroelectricity. Those are a lot of sources where no matter what, they're going to be there, right? The wind is going to be there because the sun is still out. As long as the sun is up in the sky burning, we're going to have solar, we're going to have wind. Uh, factors like that means that it's there readily plentiful. Wood, on the other hand, again, if it's not growing at a fast enough rate to really replenish what we're using of it, then I'm not going to be able to call that a renewable resource. Uh, if we changed how we use that source, we might be able to change the category that it's in. But I would say that when you're talking about like from planting to being able to actually harvest that wood, how long does that process take? It's on the order of a lifetime or more, which means for a single person, that's not a very renewable source. Some of the other things, of course, this is not surprising at all, uh, nuclear, oil, coal, natural gas, all those fossil fuels, right? Those technically, again, are replenished, but the rate that it does so is a span of millions of years. So it is not feasible for us to imagine that whatever we've got going on right now, we're going to replenish that supply of oil uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon. We're using it at a significantly faster rate, right? Not even a good comparison. Not something like wood. Uh, the comparison between fossil fuels and how we're actually using them, not remotely. Nuclear is a little bit more interesting as well, because technically speaking, unlike oil, we're not getting more nuclear fuel. There's a fair amount of uranium, uh, which is the primary material used for nuclear fuel rods. Uh, there's a fair amount of uranium in the Earth's crust and within, I'm sure, deeper, uh, but that's really not forming anymore because, again, remember, materials like uranium, they're formed in supernova. And, you know, last I checked, the sun has not exploded yet, and we don't have any other nearby stars that are exploding currently and spewing material out into the universe. Whatever we've got on Earth right now, as far as uranium goes, that's it. Now, technically, uh, if you're working in some sort of particle physics lab, you might be able to create a little bit more, but the energy required to create that uranium, uh, you never get that back, right? It takes significantly more energy to form new uranium than you can actually extract back out of that uranium. So uh, that one is strictly non-renewable. We're never getting that thing off the list. If we slow down to using one drop of oil every thousand years, then maybe oil becomes a renewable resource, but nuclear, certainly not. 
So primary sources, right, kind of implies that there's something else. And we call those secondary sources. These are intermediate steps uh, that we might be using for a number of different reasons. Electricity is probably the biggest one of this category, right? Electricity, besides lightning, is not naturally formed from anything. We use generators to create electricity, which is then used in all of these other sources, like a computer. Uh, but there are other places as well. Gasoline is another example, right? Gasoline is refined from crude oil, as is heating oil, as is some of the things that go into plastics, right? A lot of things come out of crude oil. Coal coke is refined coal that burns a little bit hotter that is oftentimes used for something like steel production. So there's a lot of different reasons why we might be using a secondary source. Sometimes it's better for transportation. Sometimes it's just got a higher energy density. Sometimes it's got some other feature not associated with some of these other things like a, a hotter burning temperature for coal coke. But in any case, there's a reason why we went to use each of these things. We refined it in some sort of other way that's more useful for us down the line. Um, and again, if you want to really consider something like this, right, think about how you want to actually be using your toaster. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples because this idea, I mean, so if you're talking about like a, a power plant that is running off of oil or coal nearby, sure, technically speaking, at the end of the day, you do just want heat to heat up that bread, turn it into toast. But controlling that heat, using it in a practical sense is simply not possible. Right? I don't keep like a gallon of gasoline on hand necessarily for just cooking purposes. For the most part, I'm relying on electricity for that because it's a lot easier for me to use. It's a good secondary source because of its ease of use and transportation. So, <clears throat> how well we use that energy is a slightly different question. Uh, first, we've got to bring up GDP, right? Gross domestic product. Uh, this is generally some sort of metric that we use to talk about uh, a country's economy. It's not always the most practical number to have, but you'll see this constantly thrown around uh, when you're talking about like geopolitical decisions. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's a lot of different factors refined into a single number, but that single number does make it a little bit easier to just across the board compare some things. So, that plays into a term that we call energy intensity, which is a little bit of a metric of how much economy are we getting out of the energy that we use. And this is going to be a little bit of an interesting one as well, because now we're combining a lot of different numbers together into a single data point, uh, and some of those individual numbers were themselves collected into a single data point. We lose a lot of the nuance of some of these discussions. But uh, I think this is a pretty interesting one. We can compare some different countries and imagine what goes on with these things. So again, energy intensity just calculated out would be the energy consumption divided by gross domestic product, and that is on a per person basis. So look at the US. We've got the population, we've got total consumption. Uh, it's not exactly one to one here in the growth. Uh, there have been, especially recently, some very significant uh, energy uh, efficiency solutions that we've come up with, like LED light bulbs and some other things like that. Uh, additionally, uh, you can see in some of these locations where we had the oil crisis, where suddenly that was the first time that efficiency really became an important factor for us. Uh, but again, this is not energy intensity. This is just total consumption versus the U.S. population. Energy per capita, energy per person, right? So this is scaling these two numbers together into one we can start to see the total consumption versus the consumption per capita, even though total consumption for the most part has increased. Again, we're seeing a lot more efficiency and the energy per person is going down. Now, here is that energy intensity. And this is an interesting one, right? We've got uh, a little bit of a strange distribution. Generally speaking, you can see that GDP does relate with per capita energy, right? Which is not a super surprising thing to see. A more developed country is probably using more electricity, more fuel, things like that, higher energy consumption, and they're more likely to have a stronger economy because of that, especially on a global scale. So U.S., of course, right, we've got a lot of energy consumption per person, so we do see that uh, consumption rate very much near the top there, but we've also got an extremely strong economy. So 
or kind of one endpoint of that. And then you see on the other end, some less developed countries don't have nearly the same economy, don't have nearly the same fuel consumption. So they're on the low end of this. But there are a couple interesting ones on some of these points, whether they're above or below the line. Some interesting features, All right? If we're looking at a country like Russia, for example, Russia is kind of an interesting one because you have to consider what's going on with the country, where it's at, what's going on in it. Russia is another big country, but it's a big country without as many people per land mass, right? People per square mile as somewhere like the U.S. So what that means is that some of those factors like transportation for Russia are pretty significant as well. Now, a lot of the populations are condensed into uh, more urban areas in Russia. So that does reduce down on that quite a bit. But you still have a very large country that a lot of people are trying to traverse with products, transporting the individual people, other people, tourists, for example. Uh, a lot of those factors play into that. On the other hand of this as well, you're also seeing somewhere like the climate is quite different. The climate of Russia is a little bit more cold, right? A lot of the of Russia is in a tundra. And that means when you're thinking about things like actually heating and what it takes to grow food, there's just more energy required for factors like that. So we see some of these other factors. It is not just playing into the economy. And this is why I complain a little bit about the energy intensity, why it's not a, a very good number on its own. There are more things to consider. There's a lot of nuance that it just kind of dissipates when you condense everything down to this single number. But you can start to see with a little bit more explanation why a country might be in a certain location. China is another example to focus on here, right? Because looking at some place like China, uh, the energy per capita is quite low. There are still a lot of people that are living in rural areas in China that don't have nearly the same sort of power consumption. Um, but additionally on this, for the people that are in more urban developed areas, what you oftentimes see is that China's economy is very much focused on industry production. And what that means is that they have to use more energy. When you're talking about something like steel production, that takes a significant amount of energy. When you're talking about something like refining different materials or taking those refined materials and putting them into some sort of product, like a computer, like some sort of plastic children's toy, a lot of those factors mean that at the end of the day, there's a lot more energy being consumed per person because a lot of the jobs, a lot of the economy that China's based on is more energy intensive. Where somewhere like the United States has oftentimes shifted more to a service economy and a service economy where we are effectively exporting our industry to these other countries means that the energy that we're actually using for the economy is typically not as intensive. Offices do not take nearly the same amount of energy as something like a steel mill. Uh, but when we have less of those material requirements, not as much energy is needed where we're still benefiting from that in the economy. Somewhere like Japan or Switzerland, uh, that's another instance where a lot of those countries are, again, no longer quite going for an industrial economy. They're more focused in on a service economy at this point. Uh, and a little bit more of a service economy does take less energy, but also you've got some of the factors like less transportation needs. Population density is very high in these countries. There's not nearly as far to travel. And I think there's also a little bit of a cultural difference about what gets used in different locations. If you want to look in Europe, there's a lot less things like air conditioning that would take a pretty significant amount of energy. So just a little bit of uh, food for thought on what's going on with these things. When you look at a graph like this, it is not just immediately uh, something that you can pull away from that. There's a little bit more nuance to where these countries are located, but I think there's a reasonable explanation. It shows what's going on with these things. And if you've got that explanation, it does form a more complete picture. Now, compare this with something like life expectancy. And this is a fun one. Uh, it, it's a little bit more grim. I shouldn't say it's necessarily a fun one, but I like to think about this a little bit. What we see here is that as energy consumption goes up, life expectancy for the very beginning here is spiking, right? You, you see this huge increase in life expectancy, but once you reach a certain threshold, right around where Poland is, maybe, maybe a little bit further than that, but once you meet this certain threshold, suddenly life expectancy doesn't continue to increase, right? We decay, there's this asymptote. 
uh, which in part is really where you can expect humans to survive to. In ideal conditions, humans are going to die one day, right? There's no getting around that one. But what we're seeing in some of these earlier countries, and of course, this is a little bit of a discussion, I do recommend, if you want to think about this a little bit, pause the video here, consider this. But I'll continue this discussion for my thoughts at the very least. Some of these less developed countries, you're looking at places like farming. You're looking at places like manual labor. You're looking at things like medicine, like home care. There's a lot of these factors, even things like refrigeration, heating, Factors like this that have a dramatic significance on somebody's life expectancy because they have a dramatic significance on somebody's health. Once you pass that certain threshold, right, arguably the threshold right around here is where we're basically saying, okay, your basic needs have been met. You've got food, you've got refrigeration to store that food, you've got access to medicine, you've got access to transportation to get to a hospital. Now your basic needs for survival are met. Beyond this point, it's really luxury. Uh, and I say luxury and I don't mean like our traditional thoughts of luxury are things like extravagant jewelry and things like that. It's not exactly what I'm saying. Uh, you know, there is very significant qualities of life or, you know, th these these factors that play into the quality of life of somebody uh, that I'm throwing into this category of luxury here. But it's basically saying anything beyond your basic needs, you're no longer increasing life expectancy, but you might still be increasing quality of life. Things like mental health benefit from some of those things. Uh, but it's a little bit of an interesting discussion here, right? Especially because you can compare some of these things. If this is your only metric, then it's clear that what's going on up here is extraneous. But there might also be some discussion on the other hand that basically says, hey, you know, there are these quality of life features that why would we reduce those quality of life features? Living just by your basic means is, you know, in the 21st century, not really living. Not in the way that we think about it anymore, at least. Um, but just a little bit, a little bit to think about here. I know we've only got a handful of countries, but it does start to paint a picture of what's going on, where we use this energy. So, uh, if I'm talking about how this energy is actually used, a lot of the time we break it up into economic sectors. And we've got four really big ones and electricity kind of its own fifth. Uh, but generally speaking, we've got residential, we've got commercial, we've got industrial, we've got transportation. And now none of the four of these are really completely separated from each other, of course. Uh, but broadly speaking, the broad strokes of things, this gives us a little bit of a sense of where this energy is going, how it's used in each of these sectors, because they each have their own needs for this. Electricity is kind of its own sector because realistically, the end goal is never electricity, right? Electricity is an intermediate step between other places. But at this point, it is using a significant enough portion of all of our energy that we do kind of put it into its own category. But anyways, let's go through these piece by piece, looking at something like residential consumption. Uh, and this is comparing, you know, just about the same average house, um, looking at these things by the years. You can see the breakdown of where a lot of these things go. A significant amount is going into space heating. And part of that is the climate, right? Some of that is certainly the climate, but another very significant portion of that is that generally speaking, Air conditioning is a lot more efficient for what it does than heating is. Most of the time, heating is basically a one-to-one -one energy transfer, right? Any energy that was in the natural gas is now released as heat into the home. But something like air conditioning actually benefits from some of the laws of thermodynamics in that you can extract more energy than you have to put in. So what am I talking about here? If I'm considering something like a refrigerator, let's imagine your refrigerator takes in 100 joules of energy from the wall outlet. It exports somewhere on the order of 450 joules, right? So 100 of that, of course, we use. That was in our consumption phase of things. We do need to consume some energy, but then extracting energy back out of that refrigerator, we're able to get a lot more energy than just what we put into it. Right? In that sense, it's a three and a half times. The first hundred comes in, but then, you know, a net leaving energy of 350 joules. 
houses are, in a sense, just really big refrigerators, right? We're not trying to keep it down at like 35 degrees Fahrenheit anymore, but it's working in the same principles here. We've got a cool space and a hot space outside of it. We're trying to make that cool space just a little bit colder. So operating on factors like that, we don't need nearly the same amount of energy to get the same result from air conditioning that we typically do from space heating. But even looking at that, something like that, right? Uh, things like insulation have, has improved. Windows are oftentimes double paned now, much better at that as well. Uh, space heating is dropping in the factor that is required to keep it going. And air conditioning, because it's becoming more prevalent in locations, that's picking up just a little bit more. Um, you know, outside of that, water heating, another very significant source of this, right? And that's, you know, arguably kind of combined there with space heating, but again, better insulation, higher efficiency of things. Uh, what has definitely increased is the appliances that we use, right? Simply put, because oftentimes there are just more appliances at this point, bigger computers, more frequent computers, a lot of smart devices, a lot of pieces that are using a significant amount of energy. So... Uh, let's compare a couple different countries here. This is looking at these individual sectors, right? But uh, I think this really does paint that picture of what we were talking about before with energy intensity, looking at how some of these things play into each other. United States, again, a very significant portion of energy just goes into transportation. Smaller country like Japan, but similar development, doesn't nearly need that same amount, right? So it's not even necessarily that these other sections are uh, significantly larger, what it really is, is the transportation is so much smaller and those other factors, those other economic sectors kind of fill in that space. Uh, similarly as well, the house size between these countries, quite different. Japan frequently has much smaller homes, much more tightly packed, so it doesn't take as much energy because you don't have to heat as much. Somewhere like Ghana, the majority of that energy goes into residential now because you don't need quite as much transportation. There are not many people commuting uh, not in the same way, at least. Um, but the economy that Ghana's built off of just doesn't require that same amount of energy. Residential is where a lot of that energy goes because we're slowly developing that country a little bit more and people are using it in their houses or for other uh, personal needs, I should say. Okay, so let's jump back into some of these different sectors. Looking at the U.S. specifically again, we're looking at commercial consumption, where that goes. Uh, there's some different factors in this one. You can see a lot of this goes into lighting, a lot of this goes into refrigeration, a lot of it goes into ventilation, uh, and this pretty significant amount goes into cooling as well. Uh, but this is kind of a fun thing. If you're looking at commercial consumption, thinking about things like malls, the Mall of America, uh, a very large mall in D.C., actually runs their air conditioning all year round. Reason being, these other factors, lighting and refrigeration and ventilation, those naturally kind of produce heat. Right, if you run your laptop for quite some time, you'll notice that it gets warm because at the end of the day, that's just where waste energy is going. A lot of the energy is going into making the computer run itself, but waste energy comes out as heat. Similarly, lighting, refrigeration, ventilation, waste energy comes out as heat. Uh, and between the heat from all of that energy and the number of people constantly radiating heat out within these buildings as well, means that for non-residential settings, you actually need to put a lot more energy into cooling because you need to run cooling most of the time. But other than that, there's not too much we can glean from this, not without looking at like individual businesses and buildings or regions. So uh, let's keep moving on for now. Looking at something like industrial consumption, you can start to see where a lot of these different sources are coming from. Right. And you'll notice even here, this is even more of a contrast of what's going on with coal, for example. Coal is just decreasing. Electricity, as we get better with it, we're using more and more and more of it. Natural gas and petroleum are oftentimes used not necessarily in uh, refining for fuels and burning, but refining in terms of plastics and other production chemical wise. Bulk chemical takes up a lot of that. Refining takes up another big portion of that. Between the two of these, we've got about 50 percent of our energy consumption. Then we've got these other trace things that we plug in with industry, but uh, really not the same kind of amounts here. Okay, finally here, talking about transportation, light trucks, uh, right? So this is things like box trucks and uh, different companies moving around. If you've got a flower company that does transportation, that's where a lot of that's coming from. Cars and motorcycles, right? There's a lot of people on the road. There's a lot of people that need vehicles. So that's another very significant portion. 
other trucks because we have a lot of semi trucks in the US. That's another pretty significant portion of where that energy is. Uh, and then we've just got a couple other things as well. Uh, uh, but I think this is probably not surprising to anyone, right? I, 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 the first time that I saw these numbers, I was not surprised at all to see what I'm seeing. I think it feels pretty standard about what I expect, to be honest. So I think that closes us out. This last slide is just some details about the class. Uh, but that's closing out what we're talking about here. Next time around, we're going to start our discussion a little bit more on the physics side talking a little bit more about what's going on with energy, how we actually define some of these things, some different metrics that we can use to talk about these. So ultimately, we can understand a little bit more about how this energy can actually be used. But that's all that we've got for 1-2. Thanks for being here. I'll see you again next time.